All right, welcome everybody to the January 26 Hyperledger Technical Oversight Committee call. As you are all aware, uh, two things that we must abide by on the call. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, which is linked in the agenda. For announcements today, we have the standard uh, Hyperledger Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter that goes out each Friday. Uh, if you have something that you would like to reach the hundreds of Hyperledger developers that we have in the community, please leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda. Any other announcements that anybody has for today? Okay, I will take that as a no. Uh, so for quarterly reports, uh, we still have the outstanding Q4 Hyperledger URSA report. Uh, we have the Sawtooth report that's coming in today. Uh, I did get reached out to from the Sawtooth folks. They are currently working on a release, and then they will get to the report probably later today. So we should expect to see that coming in. Um, check your inboxes or your task list to see when that does show up. And then uh, Stephen was uh, ahead of schedule, I guess. It got us the Hyperledger Aries report um, ahead of schedule. So I saw that a number of people have had the opportunity to review that already. Uh, if you haven't, that one is waiting for your review. Um, but for those who have had a chance, are there any questions on the Hyperledger Aries report that anybody has? Okay, looks like we just have some updates uh, for the data from the insights report that needs to come in um, on that. So we'll expect that to get updated here probably shortly. Um, <laughs> I'm just laughing. I'm watching the uh, participants come in. We now have two people who are Hyperledger project folks. So um, I just think it's amusing. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, next next thing that we have on the agenda here is to uh, talk about the move the project reports to GitHub. Uh, so I think we're probably ready to make a decision on this today. Uh, I did see a number of people who have agreed to this on the chat um, and have provided some input as to where they uh, think these reports should be hosted. Uh, any questions or comments that exist on this that we need to talk about in the meeting? Any concerns that anybody has they'd like to bring up? I know last week the, the concern was whether or not um, we would have any objections from people who submit project reports, didn't see any that showed up on the chat, um, but any other comments or concerns that we have with this? So to see this is on the I, I have no problem. I just think that uh, obviously we will have to update the documentation. So wait, I mean, I you know I'm thankful for uh, Ryan made the effort to to elaborate on the process being proposed, which he didn't have initially. I think this all sounds good, but we need to capture that somewhere else than in that issue eventually, right? Correct. That is correct. We'll have to make sure that we redirect people to where they need to go uh, to, cr to create those project reports in the future. Um, probably on the wiki, we'll, we'll put a right. link there directly. And then um, I think there's a few other places that we talk about project reports that we should consider uh, either updating and or moving uh, from the wiki. I, I think there was a uh, document that we had wrote two years ago maybe about the the value of these project reports and why we create them um, that could potentially be moved over to uh, github as well as just a kind of introduction for this particular section on the 
on the TOC site. Um, but yeah, we'll definitely have to go through and see if there's any other places that we'll have to update. So otherwise, we had talked about reaching out to the projects to ask the maintainers who typically fill out those reports so they felt about it, but we haven't heard back from anybody, have we? Uh, so I did reach out on the maintainers uh, discussion yeah. channel. Um, the only thing that I saw was uh, a few people who said, yeah, this looks good, and a, a few thumbs ups, um, okay. if you will, there. Um, I didn't see anybody who objected uh, to the request. So I just, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many people submit the next pro uh, report on the wiki <laughs> and didn't get the memo on changing them using GitHub instead. Yeah, for sure, will, for sure. It will be a data point on how effective we are at reaching out the maintainers in the project. All right, any other comments or concerns? Okay, uh, no other comments, no other concerns. Um, did we want to make a motion for moving the project reports to GitHub? Yeah, oh, this Mark. is Marcus speaking. And just one question. So what will happen with the existing um, project reports, which we have on the wiki? Do we also migrate them to GitHub to have everything in a single place? That's my plan. I've, oh, yeah, I've already yeah. I've already exported them as HTML and I use Pandoc to convert them to Markdown. Um, those will come over time, uh, mostly because the HTML export uh, doesn't preserve the voting status. So I need to, I said voting status, uh, the checkbox status. So my plan is to move those over. Right, so that most probably will also mean that we will violate the proposed protocol in order to basically uh, review and approve on GitHub all the existing project updates, I, I guess. Um, yeah, so I think all the existing project updates, uh, you know, they've already obviously been approved by previous TOCs or TSCs, as the case may be. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think we'll ne necessarily need to have everybody in this TOC approve those before we can get those merged over. I think that was your question, right, Marcus? Yes. Arno? So I, I mean, if there's a way to transfer the old stuff, I mean, the GitHub, I think is great, but I, can we just leave with having a link uh, from GitHub to, to the wiki and say, hey, for all the reports, go check that out over there? What I would like to do um, is mitigate this durability point two, right? So we've, we've lost founding documents and I want to get them into Git. Okay. Um, I don't plan on deleting them from the wiki, uh, but I just want to get them somewhere version controlled that's not the wiki. Okay, that's fine, thanks. All right, any other? comments, concerns, questions before we go to a motion? So I'll move. All right, Arno, thank you. Uh, do we have a second? Yes, I can. All right, thanks, Arun. All right. Um, so, Rai, do you want to just take us through a objection, abstain, approve? Sure. Um, 
All those who object say nay. All those who abstain say abstain. All those who approve say aye. 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 The motion before the TOC uh, passes by voice vote. All right. Thanks, Rye. All right. So for our next agenda item, um, we have a discussion about some proposed task forces. So just to uh, bring up to speed those who may not have been on the TOC last year, uh, we had last year moved to running task forces during the second half of the TOC call, uh, with the first half being used for uh, discussion and decisions, um, potentially, depending on the agenda, we um, did tend to go beyond the half an hour mark. Uh, but the, the intention really is to run task forces so that we're getting some work done um, by the TOC. And uh, last year, I think we had four different task forces that we ran during the TOC. Um, and then a number of those task forces also had like off cycle meetings where they met and um, get got some work done outside of the TOC calls. So I think the, the intention is to continue that practice here. Uh, we did have quite a lot of uh, suggestions and, and goals that people had in our first TOC meeting this year where we can possibly create some task forces. I did uh, try to create a list of those. I did have some people add to that list uh, earlier in the week. And so uh, you can see the full list here uh, of proposed task forces that were based on both our goals, discussions, and other things that are ongoing in the um, in the community. So uh, I first wanted to start with a conversation about whether or not these look like the right set of task forces. I don't think we can um, obviously do all of them initially, but I think we can start with some of them. And then uh, as those close up, we can bring others on to the list. Um, but I do want to see if, first of all, if there are others that we should be adding to this list. Bobby? Yeah, I was looking at the list all week and kind of thinking and trying to um, get a higher view looking down on these task forces. And I kind of think the list we have, um, when you start with the project best practices, I think out of that task force would flow the badging, the documentation, um, and possibly security so that you would have the best practices and then possibly get badges for creating correct documentation guidelines. Again, the documentation um, would be a task force in and of itself with the suggestions for the community to use. Um, you know, the best practices would be decided and by task force or whatever, but there would be a place where people would be able to go to see that everything for each project is badged or, you know, awarded the proper, uh, I'm not, badging is the lack of better word. Um, and I think that those three kind of can be tied together into one. Um, and then I have comments on onboarding for later, but that's just for those three right there. For me, it just seems like they are, kind of in the same family. Comments? Yeah, Bobby, I, I, I agree with you. I think that project best practices is a very huge task force. And I do think we probably have to break it down into some sub task forces because I, I still, I think like the best practices for automated pipelines might fall into project best practices as well, right? Um, and, and so, you know, I, I guess the question is, do we start with, um trying to figure out what all the best practices are that we want the projects to focus on and then create some task forces around those or do we work on what might be these smaller task forces around documentation and automated pipelines and uh, those feed up into the project best practices task force uh, at a later point and I, I I mean, I understand. I think I have the same sort of question in my mind. And so I, I don't know which way is the best, right? Is it breaking down the project best practices or is it 
building up the pro project best, best practices, if you will. Arno? So for those of us who've been around for a while, uh, you probably remember that um, the way we define task forces was something along the lines of something that is, you know, that has a very uh, fairly narrow scope with a clear mission that is expected to be delivered in a fairly uh, bounded uh, timeline, right? And so for that reason, I do think it's better to have smaller scopes and like topics. I do think that, you know, best practices is indeed too broad and, uh, or it would have to be something that, as you were saying, the goal of which it becomes like spawning off other smaller task forces that are more narrowly focused. And, and the experience shows that it's much more, you get a lot more momentum when you have a fairly well-defined narrow scope that you can execute on and deliver quickly because people get, you know, you do get a boost out of, you know, the satisfaction of having achieved something. And, and, and then people are encouraged to participate in more task forces because you get a sense of achievement rather than having some kind of really long-winded, uh, task force that just never seem to end and it becomes much less obvious what you're achieving and it can become demotivating. Yeah, I agree. I, I put a link into the task force guide um, that we had created in the, the chat um, for this meeting. Um, and in that document, it does talk about uh, being the task forces should last no longer than six months. Uh, as far as time to complete, they, they have to have uh, the introduction and of what the task force is and the tasks that are to be completed and the deliverables or, or the work product, right? So um, I, I agree that we definitely want to make these things smaller uh, as far as what it is that we're trying to accomplish with each of these task forces. And if we were to decide that the project best practices task force was something that we wanted to start with, then it would um, it would definitely be a case where I think we, we start with a list, right? That's the, the, the initial task that needs to be done, a list of what we believe these best practices are that we would include there. Um, and Dave, I know you have your hand up. You were also the one to recommend that in the goal. So I uh, would appreciate your thoughts on this as well. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so my intention with that one was not to boil the ocean into all project best practices under that task force, but to pull together some of the existing information that's in various places so that it's like a, a one-stop shopping place where people can see everything and then also have a structure such that we can link to other things as they come in with these other task forces. So I do see from that perspective, it's kind of a focus thing just to pull together a structure of how we want to um expose the stuff to the outside world um but then yeah there'll be a lot of open items that the other task forces will complete over time all right thanks Dave. and arno i guess back to your point right about smaller task forces that's also why the security um has two separate um, items that are listed there. I think you and Hart had been talking about trying to make those, you know, a discrete tasks that could be accomplished in uh, the short time frame that we would want from a task force. So um, completely agree that we want things that are smaller in nature. All right, if we could go back to the meeting record uh, so that people can take a look at these. See if there's other ones that they think might be something that we want to include um, or um, possibly, you know, have if anybody has questions on kind of what we think these task forces might be. Um, obviously, that will be up to uh, the chair to really define that, but, uh, you know, love to have any additional thoughts of other task forces that we might want to focus on short term. John? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to comment on a little bit of, you know, where the learning materials development working group is looking to go this year. And so we've talked about focusing on the onboarding task force, which is, I think, the fifth item down there. And uh, really being able to get people who are interested in the Hyperledger ecosystem engaged and being either contributors or maintainers. And then also looking at, as part of that, delivering some educational content that uh, would be a regular series of meetups that uh, can be promoted by Hyperledger that we can, you know, continue to go through and provide educational or instructional content. And uh, also, you know, just look at continuing to focus on the career fair that we've had for now two years in a row and to make sure that that's on track for 2023 as well. So that would be my only comments about uh, task force this year. So, so John, um, I, I guess I have a question. So the onboarding, the education um, pieces, those are distinct and separate task forces that you are thinking about doing in the learning materials working group? Yes. Uh, and so the great thing is Arun is on the call here. You know, he's done a great job of working on the start here.hyperledger.org and, you know, going ahead and collaborating with Arun and that team and really continuing to build that out. Also providing some resources that are accessed a lot on the hyperledger.org website. So people know, you know, really what's popular content and, you know, making sure it's really a good onboarding experience. And if there are people that come to the community and want to get engaged, you know, being able to really point them in the right direction and get them going quickly is the thing. And then uh, I've also been conferring with Jim Sullivan around doing these instructional uh, content workshops and, you know, being able to have more of, you know, the library that we can offer to the Hyperledger community around these uh, instructional workshops and including them in the Hyperledger YouTube channel. Bobby? Hi, first I wanna um, just put it out there that um, John has stepped up um, to be the chair of the Learning Materials Working Group and congratulations and I'm so happy he's done that. So hats off to, to John for that. Um, I was thinking um, with the new task force for the TOC, that documentation and onboarding become one of those. Um, I would gladly take a leadership role in that and work with John and Arun to, to make that happen. Um, the onboarding um, definitely has to be um, parsed out a little bit. I think you have onboarding citizens, onboarding developers, onboarding SIG chairs, onboarding maintainers, and onboarding TOC members. So there's definitely a lot of onboarding that needs to be uh, talked about and determined. So again, those two, John and I have, you know, worked well together and we would gladly keep moving with those. So if anybody has any suggestions or um, information that they would like to help us, and I, I think the badging process might come from some of the um, work in those two task forces. Okay, uh, that's really interesting, Bobby. I think the um, I wanted to see if maybe I can edit this list uh, because you had onboarding SIG chairs, uh, onboarding TOC members, uh, onboarding maintainers, maintainers, onboarding developers. Okay. And onboarding. citizens. What are citizens? People like me who my first year here just was involved in calls, going to meetups, scheduling meetups, creating meetups. You know, we're not developed, we weren't well on the develop, but you know, just people who want to be in the community. Yeah, community members is a good word. Okay, too. great. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, any other ones that I should include here? Okay. Um, so I just I wanted to capture that because I do think as you look at or as we look at these task forces, we should, uh, as Arno mentioned, right, make sure that these are distinct and, and small enough to um, to be covered in the six month time period that we have 
set up for task forces. Uh, so I appreciate you kind of expanding those, if you will. David? Thanks, Tracy. Uh, plus one, I just wanted to plus one what both Bobby and John said. I totally agree that onboarding is a broad topic, so it's nice that we're clarifying what we're talking about. And you're right, and the way we onboard one of those groups is going to be different from the way we onboard another, so that makes sense to me. Um, I also think the task force structure is going to be a, bit, a better format for the work that people in the learning materials working group want to do than perhaps the working group model itself. So I, I think this will be an interesting experience to see if the task force brings more people into those efforts. I also think it's great to try to combine those. I mean, I think we've already mentioned it, but you know, for example, the work that Arun and the India chapter has done around Start Here has been great. And the work the learning materials working group has been doing has been great too, but those have been separate efforts. You know, I think it's much better to have one combined effort at bringing new people into the community than having multiple ones. So I'm really excited that people seem interested in the onboarding task force and then I'd, I'd be happy to support all that. All right, thanks, David. Um, yeah, I think the, so we've talked about kind of the project best practices. Um, Stephen, you had suggested the automated best or uh, the best practices for the automated pipelines uh, as a goal um, to try and capture. So I, I did include that here. Hopefully that one is self-explanatory to people. Um, but Stephen, did you just want to remind people of what you what you were thinking when you brought that up as a goal? Sure. Um, we're doing a lot on um, in in the various projects we have on what I consider sort of reinventing and rediscovering what's the best way to produce artifacts, where to produce them, and so on. It also goes back to what um, our Arno talked about last week, which is, you know, handling dependencies and things like that, looking for, um, you know, what tools we're using for making sure our, our um, artifacts we're producing are safe. Um, so going through that, we had a huge effort on Indy to basically redo what had been done and it you know it was pretty extensive but it was it was very manual and and um, difficult to use and, and bringing it up uh, to to current best practices I think um, I think it's there and and applying those um, would be very helpful so that's that's sort of the idea of that one okay um Dave I added these two bullet points to the project best practices. Uh, I think those were what you had suggested as what your intention was, was to gather the current best practices and determine gaps um, that might exist. Is, did I capture that correctly, Dave? Yeah, it looks good, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the badging uh, life, uh, life cycle one um, that exists here is one that we have talked about multiple times in the last well, I don't know, probably ever since I started joining PSC, POC calls, um, where uh, we're, we're trying to figure out how people can best determine the status of projects. Um, we've talked about potentially coming up with a number of different badges that people can um, make sure are current and, and accurate. We've talked about, you know, is our life cycle the correct life cycle? Do we need to do anything to, to change uh, kind of the status of where projects are? Um, do we need to have some sort of yearly review cycle or, or that sort of thing? And so I think this is a task force that I added specifically because the governing board had a discussion in December regarding uh regarding this and so i think it's something that they're sending back to us to take a another look at and see if we can get it right this year or not um so that's what that one is all about, all about. the documentation task force i think there was uh some comments in our initial meeting about the one where we store our documentation and to the format of our documentation and making them more consistent across the board. Um, and, and so I think that is what that particular task force is all about. Does anybody have any additional items that they remember from, from the documentation, uh, Bobby? 
Yeah, I worked with that with um, one of the uh, community members, Ben, and he did a great job. Uh, we just really don't know where to put it. It was more suggestions. And again, I know that um, it needs to be updated and needs to be um, looked at, but there was great momentum on that just to make it easier for maintainers and um, developers to transfer their um, GitHub stuff into um, a un not a uniform, but an accepted hyperledger format with a lot of leeway for them to pick, you know, their own styles and stuff, but just to give them some basic guidelines. Um, so I think that that was one piece of the documentation um, task force. And then the other um, where I think there might be um, another opportunity is with the documentation, almost like a hyperledger library um, for people to go and, you know, not research, but look up and yeah, research actually. Um, information that is um, available to the community. Okay, and Stephen? Um, yeah, I was gonna add that a, a bunch of the documentation challenge is um, the tooling involved in, in publishing a decent, um, putting the documentation into a, um, a format accessible to the set of onboarding people that are listed below. Um, and so common tooling for doing that and just being able to spin up a repo and have, you know, all of these things like the best practices for automated pipelines, but also documentation um, there. So it's more a checklist and, and, and the ideas are already there of how to do it. Um, readmes, to me, readmes and, and markdown files are, um, so 2018 and we have to get up to 2023 and that means actually publishing these out to a more accessible um in a more accessible way okay uh right uh one thing that we could do is uh github does have um template repos so it would be it's possible to have a you know have a repo that's a template that contains all of that and you know it might uh be overkill in some cases because the first commit would be someone from the community immediately removing all the stuff that doesn't matter i don't have a strong feeling about it um but you know, it, 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 is, it is something that's available. Okay, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Marcus? So when I think about documentation, so sometimes as a, if I go to some doc documentations of several projects, so sometimes the scope of the documentation, I think it's not really clear and maybe uh, it depends on the lack of some guidelines to define, okay, what should be in a good documentation for operators, for end users, for just people who would like to get the, the gist of a project. But the documentation for uh, a new contributor to a project, a new developer should maybe look completely different. And so I think there, uh, I, yeah, maybe some guidance on how to define c certain scopes or the audience uh, would be helpful. Okay, great. All right, um, so moving down here to the support it project. Uh, so in the latest version of the charter, we introduced a concept called support it projects. Um, support it projects are uh, those that have separate technical oversight uh, pursuant to a separate technical charter. And uh, those projects are called supported projects in the charter. Uh, one, one of the things that we need to do uh, is find all of the places where we need to update documentation uh, of how we would deal with a supported project uh, from the technical oversight committee. For example, do we require quarterly reports from supported projects? Um, what do we do when a incubated or a, a new project proposal comes in for incubation? And we would um, be reviewing that 
uh, as far as the project that's coming in, like, is there anything that we have to do to the life cycle documentation, that sort of thing. Um, who's ever scrolling it to the very top uh, in the very first section. Uh, it's the very last par paragraph of the section. Uh, it talks about uh, supported projects. So um, those are the sorts of things that I was thinking about for that particular task force. It's just understanding what that truly means for us um, as we now have those as part of the charter and might expect to see some of those projects coming in. Uh, it would be good if we have an idea of how we want to handle those before they actually show up. Um, so yeah, that's what that particular task force was intended to represent. And then uh, I think the the last two are security task forces. Um, or no, Hart, I don't know if one of you want to talk about these uh, from the perspective of what exactly you were thinking here. Uh, I'm happy to talk. Arno, do you want to talk? No, it's all right. Go ahead. But Jim has his hand up. So that's why I was pausing. Jim, go first. Uh, no, um, I just, I was still a little puzzled about this concept of this supported project. Um, maybe someone can give an example. Yeah, I think the, the example is, let's say we have a um, project that already has a brand associated with it, um, but they want to bring their source space into Hyperledger. Um, they want to basically be whatever project name, uh, a Hyperledger project instead of Hyperledger project name. Um, and this is uh, a supported project. They have, they will have their own technical charter uh, that they will work under. And um, beyond that, I'm not sure that I can actually give you much more information about how that's going to work uh, within Hyperledger because we don't have it. And that's why I think this task force is, right. is really important is to really try and understand what would that look like for us um, as a project comes in? How do we approve that project? Um, what's, what additional steps would need to be taken to make sure that project is remaining healthy? Um, and that there's nothing that we would want to do from a, a TOC perspective. So that's like um, hosting it, but not owning it. Is that the right way to understand it? So the source code will be hosted in Hyperledger repositories, but we don't, um, Hyperledger doesn't quote unquote own that, the copyright of it uh, or the license of it, um, like we do with the regular projects. I believe that's correct. Daniela, any thoughts on that? Um, any additional ideas you can add beyond what has been said? Or heart? I don't know if one of you have a thought to add to this. Can you repeat the question, please? I apologize. No, that's okay, Daniela. The, the question is the supported projects, so the projects that are coming in as a mm -hmm. Hyperledger project, um, but yeah. are not branded with Hyperledger. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, they have their own brand. I think the, the, the question is, are these projects that we would consider hosted by Hyperledger, but not necessarily owned by Hyperledger, or, um, you know, we're, we're trying to understand them better, I guess, in this context. Yeah, they would be part of the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, so they would be, you know, governed under the talk, but have their own project charters if they so do wish. And the same, um, you know, governance and support project services, et cetera, that we have today uh, for a Hyperledger XXX project would be applied in the same way. So what is the key difference? The key difference is that they don't need to have the name Hyperledger in front of their name. It's a marketing, it's a marketing thing more than anything else. Okay, and Daniela, uh, uh, the fact that it's uh, still governed by TOC, does that mean uh, how they elect uh, maintainers, how that community grows would still follow? That, that's the, just like today's projects, right? So right, okay. just, yeah, exactly the same. 
as you know, a Hyperledger Firefly project, the same way that you know the maintainers um, are selected, the processes within that project are selected. Um, it's the same thing. M maintainers are kings here and queens. Gotcha. Thanks. Tracy, did that address the question? Yeah, I think so. Although I still think there's a bit of just confusion about what a separate technical charter truly means. Um, you know, and, you know, is there anything that's going to need to be a concern for this TOC and the sort of processes that we currently have um, around you know, would we expect these projects to, projects to still report to the TLC? I mean, based on what you said, it sounds like yes. Um, and so maybe there's not really any changes that have to occur here, but I just, I feel like uh, when when we looked at the, the technical charter that was created, uh, I think for the non-creds project that I don't know if we got rid of at this point, <laughs> um, I, I just feel like there were some, concerns around what was stated in there and the way in which it um, potentially conflicted with the Hyperledger Charter and the TOC processes. Okay. Hart's got his hand up. I'll let him address that part. Yeah, Hart. Yeah, Tracy, you're, you're totally right that uh, the suggested charter that we thought about using for a non-creds was, was not workable. Uh, but in response to the project charters, like one thing we want to encourage projects to do uh, is to have more documentation about things like how maintainers are promoted, how releases are handled, you know, what policies, uh, you know, does the project sort of use, uh, all of this stuff that would sort of be in a charter document. Um, so one of the things we want to do is to, to encourage projects to, to document and have this. Um, and while this isn't exactly a charter, uh, it is sort of in the same vein and spirit. So we think that if we sort of encourage projects to, to have stuff like this, it won't be too different from, you know, a supported project uh, having its own charter in the long run. Does that make sense? Makes sense for me, Hart. I, um, I think I get it. Not sure everybody else does, but uh, Jim did it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe <laughs> last question for me that that that'll help me. Uh, the the need for creating this new type of project uh, is it to allow a rather mature community to come into High Pleasure but maintain their own brand. Uh, that was basically why we need this because sounds like everything is the same. Yeah, that's one thing. Um, you know, another thing is we have been, we've talked to projects that might be interested in coming into the Linux Foundation, uh, but they, you know, they don't have enough, say, you know, funding or whatever to become their own top level project. And, you know, they're they're related to blockchain, but they're not, you know, specifically blockchain. Right. Um, you know, for instance, if you had a project that was, you know, exclusively focused on zero knowledge proofs, right? You know, Hyperledger might be a good home, but you might not want to market that as, you know, specific or exclusive to blockchain, right? Because there are a lot of different other applications. Uh, so, so that's sort of the another scenario we were thinking about, uh, in addition to the branding one, which you correctly bring up as an important one. That helps, thanks. All right, so back to the security um, task forces that are listed here. I didn't. Uh, I don't know who who won the the fight there. Was it Arno or Hart? Uh, I can talk about it. It's okay. okay. Although, as a side note, I had a side conversation with uh, with Hart, and I think he's suffering from the same. Um, uh, how do you call that? Like a challenge that Rai used to have, and. Uh, you know, I used to encourage Rai to speak up on the TSC calls. He felt like, well, as a staff member, it wasn't for him to speak up. And I think we have a lot more to gain 
from having those guys participate actively than not. And so I've been saying the same to Hart uh, since, you know, especially he was a TAC or TSC member and we benefited from a lot of his participation over the years. And I think it'd be a shame that now because he's on the staff side, he just becomes quiet all the time. So with that being said, sorry, hard to put you on the spot, but I hope this way, you know, it clears things out. You know, if anybody disagrees with me, but I read, I'd be very surprised. Speak up anyway. But so on this very point, the vulnerability disclosure is what I've talked about before, which has to do with, um, you know, the OpenSSF has published a best practice guide kind of thing that describes pretty, pretty, uh, in, in pretty great details, uh, the kind of processes open source projects should have in place, the kind of documentation they should have in place to handle vulnerability disclosures, reports from security researchers, for instance, and the process, how to, how you get into the actual dialogue, the communication, the protocol you should follow to, to handle the, those reports and the security researchers who, you know, by the way, are not the, always very easy to deal with. Let's just put it this way. And so this task force is about looking at the very specific aspect of adopting this broadly within Hyperledger making sure, you know, developing a policy as to what that actually means to implement this across the board for all the project to have, to have that. I don't know if there's any question about this, otherwise I can talk about the second one. Uh, maybe at your urging, I'll jump in here, Arno. Um, so, Please. you know, as all of you know, or many of you know, Arno is heavily involved with the uh, open SSF. Um, and, you know, they have a lot of nice tools, um, but one thing that we really noticed was that they didn't have, you know, a fantastic template for a vulnerability disclosure process. So what we'd like to do with the task force is to write, you know, default vulnerability uh, disclosure processes for Hyperledger projects that you know projects could use and maybe we have one maybe we have a couple uh, but the idea is we would have a default template for vulnerability disclosure processes and says that says some you know and the, the idea is basically do this unless you know you know what you're doing and you have good reasons to do otherwise um, so you know i went to the open ssf working group on vulnerability disclosures uh, yesterday um arno was also there uh they don't have this in quite the detail that they want yet or, or that we want yet or they want um, and they're actually willing to work with us on this um, so if, if we come back and say hey you know can you help us with this they've already said they would say yes um, and we can push whatever uh outputs that we have you know, as examples to the open SSF. So, you know, we can sort of be like the, you know, the umbrella project, you know, setting the standard, um, you know, for this. And, you know, I think this, this would be a, a really good collaboration that could help both us and the open SSF. Um, you know, and, and looking ahead, uh, we also want to do something similar for the SIG store uh, stuff which is the next topic but i'll you know i'll stop for now um are there any sort of questions on this yeah just i will add on the disclosure thing that you were just talking about essentially the document they publish describes the process and tells you you need to publish your process but they didn't go as far as actually giving you a template that you can just start from to, to say, okay, this is where we're going to publish and maybe we need to make some adjustment. And that's what uh, Hort has been talking about. Exactly, thanks for the clarification. So the, the, the last point on the security artifact signing, it has to do with this notion of, you know, a, a big problem that, you know, um, we have today is there's all sorts of 
artifacts. And this is meant to be very inclusive, but it refers to you know any kind of piece of software, whether they're container images, whether they are packages, you know, like a node JS package or something. And we include those with that much verification as to the provenance of those packages. And um, there is a series of tools now that are being developed to help with the process of first signing those things and then be able to verify those signatures when you're on the consumer side. So since we all produce in the hypermedia projects artifacts such as container images and binaries, we should get into the process of signing all those artifacts using some of the tools that are now available. They're all open source, they are free to use. There are you know, infrastructures in place with like servers that are for free to use that we can leverage for that purpose. So I think that's a kind of a low hanging fruit that uh, we should, that is a best practice that we should definitely start uh, doing, implementing in hyperlinear. Thanks, Arno, for that. Um, so now that we understand what all of these different task forces are, are there others that people think we've missed or that we should um, potentially also include in our list to prioritize? Art, you're on mute. I am on mute. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Do you know if we could start jotting down uh, people who are interested in the the task forces? It might be a good idea um, if we, you know, if if we keep track of, you know, whoever's suggesting the task force might be an excellent uh, person to lead the task force. Yeah. So, uh, Hart, I think given the timing uh, that we have, just noticing that we're about five minutes out from the end of this one. My thought was that uh, we should do similar to what we did last year where we voted um, to express interest in these to see which one we which ones we might address first um, as as the uh, different task forces that we want to focus on and then um, you know from there, yes, maybe the, the right lead is the one who initially suggested it or uh, somebody else who wants to step up and actually lead that task force. Um, sounds, how does that sound? Great, sounds like a good plan, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, so my intent then would be to, in the TOC channel, uh, create uh, a poll similar to what we did, the poll for um, where we should put the GitHub project reports. Um, and then before next week, I want everybody to vote. Um, let's say vote for your top four uh, in, in what it is that you think is the most interesting and ones that you want to prioritize for uh, the start of this year. Uh, and then we'll expect that the other ones uh, will revisit uh, in the second half of the year as we move forward. So um yeah any thoughts or comments on that yeah tracy i mean does that imply i mean when we you say vote people are expressing an interest to participate in those task force as well right yes for sure for sure because if he's just saying yeah yeah you should you guys should do that but don't count on me to do it uh, I, you know, we might have things that get voted high and we don't have actually enough people to do it, then it's not very helpful, so. Would it be more, um, would this be better served as issues on the TOC repo? Because we can't really comment on polls. Sure, we can definitely do that and I, um thumbs up on the issue if you're interested in it yeah or a comment or whatever say mm -hmm. i would like to chair this or something uh, exactly yeah i definitely would love to have the people stand up to, to be chairs uh that'd be great 
Okay, so then I will create uh, the issues for these. I'll send out a message to the TOC chat and ask you to vote slash comment um, on the, the ones that you want to participate in. Yep, Rama. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, since the last HGF uh, been considering uh, creating an interoperability task force, uh, but we have other activities going on in interoperability around the world, including uh, trying for uh, having a working group under the ITF. So uh, can I think about this further and add to this list later, or is this list going to be set in stone now? Uh, no, definitely. If, if there's ever a task force that anybody thinks is something that we should focus on, uh, we can always add those. Uh, we do have that task force process, I think, uh, where it actually yeah. suggests creating an issue uh, in the TOC um, issue tracker. So that's probably uh, a really good way to, to deal with that. Sure, thanks. Okay, uh, any other comments or questions before we close out the meeting? Okay, uh, so then with that, we will close out for today. Thank you for the discussion and the uh, information on what each of these task forces should be and the um, expansion of those task forces as well. So have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.